Good morning. Good morning. Good. Uh, let's start in prayer, if, if we can do that. Well, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity uh, that you give us through your son, Jesus Christ, to be part of your family. We thank you that we can come to you in any condition, lame, broken, tired, angry, hurt, and because of who you are, you pour out your love on us, and you give us grace and mercy even when we don't deserve it. And we thank you, Father, that your patience with us is long and enduring. And Lord, I just thank you for this body, for this church family who are long and enduring with me. And Lord, I just pray today that um, what you have for them today is what you have for them today, Father. And I ask that the words that come out of my mouth, Father, just be what your heart is for them today. And I thank you for the opportunity to honor and bless you. And we give you thanks, glory, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So this one is uh, this was a little, little different because I started off with actually a much, much different topic in terms of... Um, where I was going, and, and I'll kind of give you a glance. And I haven't had a chance to talk to my spiritual dad about this one, so I'll kind of talk to him about it on tape anyway. And, you know, it's like ask for forgiveness rather than permission sort of kind of thing. <laughs> so uh, I was actually, uh, when he asked me to speak about it, the thing that the Lord actually gave me to speak on first was grace. And as I got into grace, I mean, it's, it's deep. It's deep, long, and, uh, and, and a lot of different things have, you know, transpired over the last couple of weeks. And, uh, and, and it was interesting because he said, here's what I want you to talk about. And he's given me some opportunities to experience it. And ultimately, it's not off the agenda, but he wants to turn it into a four-part series oh, yeah. on grace. Cool. Amen. So, <laughs> so... Um, so ultimately, uh, that's where we're going. But today, things changed a little bit, and what we're going to do is kind of set the table. Uh, we're going to look at a picture of grace. We're not going to talk about God's grace in totality. That's going to be for the series for us to actually walk through uh, what it is to be in God's grace and the significance of God's grace, because I think that a lot of us... Um, we have a very myopic view of what God's grace really, really is. Um, when you can confuse God's grace with something that you say over your food, I think that sometimes we, we miss it a little bit. So we're going we're gonna to talk about a picture. But before I get into that, um, my week, and I know I listen to all the really cool stories, and it's, it almost feels like I'm going to be a tad of a downer. Uh, it was a tough week. It was a tough week. The last song we sang, there was, there's the, the last verse that says, I want to take your word and shine it all around. The next line says, but first help me live it, Lord. Do we really understand what we're asking when we're asking God to help us live his word? Because I think he looks at us and goes, okay. <laughs> Sit down, strap in, and hang on, because I'm going I'm to give you an opportunity. And that's what he has really been doing with me this last week. You know, I'm looking at grace, and uh, he's, he's given me a lot of opportunities to experience grace, both from and to. And uh, I'm going to tell you guys, um, there are quite a few times this week that I missed it. I just flat out blew it. I didn't say the right thing. I didn't do the right thing. I didn't act in the right way. As a matter of fact, I was a two-year-old baby pooping in my diaper, running around and throwing it on everybody. <laughs> I mean, I mean, flat out. I mean, that's just that's that, that's that's just where I was this week at some points, you know. And uh, and when we look at this picture, uh, it's really cool that you know the Lord just kind of. He looks at us sometime, and he goes, I know where you are. You know, I was, uh, and you'll get this reference. This week, quite a few times, I was just lame in my feet, spiritually speaking, just lame. And, uh, and despite that, despite that, God still looked at me special. 
he's, he still looked at me special. I think as fathers, and this week I, I learned the second one better than, than I have before. I think as fathers, two words that you have to have in your vocabulary. Thank you. And I'm sorry. You know, so um, it was kind of one of those weeks. Going up. So yesterday, another one of those 10-hour crazy days for me. It was like I had one of those crazy days that I have on Saturday. I taught a women's personal protection class. And uh, so I was up at 7 in the morning. I got home last night about 6. And I plopped down in my office. And uh, some friends were over. And Nicole kind of comes to the door. And she says, some people are wanting to see you. And I'm like, I am really really tired. I am just worn out. But I, I got up and a bunch of people from the gym had, had come over and they'd given me a card and they said, we just want you to know how much you appreciate it. So we know that a lot of times the, the, the hours that you put in and the things you do for us, nobody sees that. But we want you to know that you're appreciated. And I said, wow, man, thank you. You know, so that was God's grace, man. He just, he said, you know, even though you were throwing poop on everybody, they didn't, they didn't hold that personal. So, so I was like, you know, that, that was, that was good. Cause when people throw poop on you, you kind of take it, you should take it personally, <laughs> you know, so, sorry, excuse me, just doesn't quite cut it when you're throwing poo on everybody. So, um, anyway, one, uh, one of them, they, they haul me outside and they say, Hey, we want you to, we want you to see something. And I go outside, and uh, leaning against my garage door is a brand new $800 Cannondale mountain bike. Um, I, I rode a Cannondale back in Pennsylvania. It was the first bike that I ever bought. I remember going into the bike shop and going through all this stuff. And the guy was like, hey, this bike's like 500 bucks. And I'm like, why? It's a, it's a bike. <laughs> <laughs> And he explained it to me. So I remember shelling out the cash and buying this bike. And, and I rode that thing forever. And I was on the bike patrol. And those are the bikes we rode. And I fell in love with Cannondale. And I moved over here. And most of the people don't ride Cannondales. They ride other bikes. And I remember talking to a guy. And I said, don't they ride Cannondales around here? And he's like, no, not very many. Anyway, but this guy remembered my heart um, about the Cannondale. And, and the, the short story, when we moved here, we had all had bikes. The girls and, and Nicole all got new bikes. I had my Cannondale, which I loved, and that was the thing that we did before we moved here is we would ride as a family all the time. There was no room in our trailer for any of our bikes, so we ended up, the girls put all of theirs on the lawn for free, and people took them, and I donated mine to the local police department so they had another bike for their bike patrol program. And uh, the Lord, I mean, this thing is it's like the BMW of bikes. I mean, this, this, this thing's got spinners, it's fat, it's all kitted out, you know. It's like, so, uh, so yesterday I was blessed beyond measures that I got to ride my bike. And then uh, I said, hey, I'm going to go out for another little ride. And my little one, my little baby, yesterday, she said, can I go with you? And I said, absolutely. And we ended up going on an hour ride down in the canyon. And it's the first time since I've been here that I've actually been in the canyon. So we rode for like an hour. Everybody was like, man, they've been gone a long time, and we just got to talk. So um, in spite of the fact that I was lame in my feet spiritually, emotionally, all week, the Lord still was pouring out grace, even though I wasn't aware of it. Even though I wasn't aware of it, he was pouring out grace on me. And... You know, I started with, as I started, you know, the spirit, how he kind of works with me as we sit down and I start going through lessons. He says, you know, there, there, are, times, there are times during our Christian walk where, where I think we, even though we know or on some level have a, an understanding or belief that there is more, we accept the less. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. We accept the less. Um, just enough, a little bit here. I'm holding on till Jesus gets back. That's kind of how we roll sometimes in, in our walk. And, and, and I'm going to say that we are spiritually sometimes lame in our feet. And 
as a result, we don't, we don't ask for more. We don't look for more. Um, we go, um, this, is, this is just the way the, that we go about it. But the question is, is that truly what God wants for us? Do we believe that? Is, that? is that truly what God wants for us? Does God just want us to hang on until Jesus gets back? I mean, if, if we're advancing the kingdom and we're hanging on until Jesus gets back, it's not moving very far. He, I mean, he, he wants us moving forward, you know. So when Jesus gets back, I mean, we're full tilt boogie then, you know what I mean? So, but a lot of us are, are, are just kind of in that, in that place. We experienced that goodness and graciousness last week after church. Man, I was on fire, you know, what Marcus did for me and just that, you know, he and I, you know, I... I deserve it, you know, and I felt better for days, you know, and that, and I'm like, and we experienced that goodness and graciousness of God, and then, and then before you know it, man, you're back in the alleys and on the street again, and you're just like, man, I, I, I just, is this for me? I don't, I don't know. I, do I deserve it? Do I belong? Who am I? And, and the one big thing this week um, really that got hit hard was who I was. Who am I? I, I, I mean, that was, that was a question. I mean, I, I had several times this week, I was asking the Lord, who am I? What do you want from me? What, what, what am I to do? I don't know. I feel lost. Who am I? And when you can get to a place where that is no longer a question, your walk will be different. When you no longer look the father in his eyes with the question of who I am, my children don't look at me and ask me who they are. They know that they are mine. The title today, Your Presence is Requested. RSVP. Are you living a life below your station sometimes? Yep. If nobody's told you, if you don't get it or haven't gotten it, I'm going to reiterate it today. You are royalty. And the Lord, the Father of the universe, the King of all kings, is requesting your presence at his table, not for a meal, continually. He's not asking you to come to the palace to visit. He's not saying, hey, come and have a sandwich with me. He's saying, here is your place. Sit at the table and dine with me always, continually, uninterrupted, is what he's saying to us today. So I was reading in my devotion and in, in, in the scripture so that we're going to look at, you know, to really create this picture. Um, we're going to go to 2 Samuel. So if you got your swords with you today. Yes, yes, yes. Got your swords. I got to get my peepers. I need not only to get the red letter Bible, I need to get the big letter Bible. <laughs> I got to get that Bible. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, so all the words are the same size as the little chapter heading. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I could read that. So we're going to be looking at Second Samuel verses nine or Second Samuel nine verses one through thirteen. And the Lord says, "Hey, I want to I want to lay a picture because uh, eventually, you know, when when uh, when my spiritual dad, Pastor Mike, says, "Yep, I'm, this is the time for you to go into this grace series," I want us to have this picture in our heart of God's graciousness because, and I'm going to tease you just a little bit, kind of give you the trailer, you know, that's the good part, right? 
God's nature. Love. God's outpouring on us is love. Agape. Unconditional, be, not because of, in spite of. God looks at you and he says, I love you in spite of, not because of, because that's my nature. I'm love. How does he pour his love out on us? His grace. His grace is the only way that he can pour out his love on us because we are truly unlovable. We can't do anything to deserve it. We can't work it. We can't make it better on our own. And he says, because you can't, I'm going to give you the stuff that will allow you to, and that's my grace. I pour on my grace on you because my nature is love and I love you. As a result, I pour out more grace on you. I pour out more grace on you because I love you because I am love and you get more grace. I love you. Wow. Amen. That's the trailer. <laughs> okay. So what I'm going to give you today is a picture, a picture of God's grace. I, I had an awesome opportunity um, this past week, uh, an, another local pastor, he and I uh, visited together, and uh, the guy might be a genius. I mean, he's, <laughs> and, and we just were sharing in some conversation and some stuff, and, uh, and you know, we, sometimes we get caught up in certain parts of the Bible, and we don't think about it in totality. So a lot of times when, you know, you go back to something Old Testament, we kind of think Israel, and that's kind of historical, and all this other stuff. I'm a little more simple. I'm going to say, just like in court, in court, there's, there's, a, there's something that comes up called stipulation. And when I stipulate to something, we are both agreeing on it as fact. It's inarguable. We're saying we're not even going to waste our time arguing this. It is stipulated. So we both acknowledge, both sides, that it is what it is. I say that we stipulate that the Bible is the breathed word of God. If it is, in fact, the breathed word of God, it is complete and total, and every single part of it has reference to our life today and forever. Every part, old and new. Are we, are we good with this? Okay, so we're going to show you a picture from the Old Testament that has relevancy to who we are today. In 2 Samuel 9, verse 1, this is David's kindness, and I might butcher his name occasionally, it's Mephibosheth. Ooh, I got it. So, David's kindness to Mephibosheth. Now David said, is there still anyone left in the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, At your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. Observation. Interpretation, application. There is a reason that they put that descriptor on him instead of Ziba just saying, yes, Jonathan still has a son. He said, but he, he has a son who is lame in his feet. Observation. We'll get back to that. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, indeed, he is in the house of, uh, I think, Machir, the son of 
Amuel in Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amuel in Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, here is your servant. Isn't that sometimes how we go to God? The king is calling you. And we go and we bawl and squall and we're like, what, what do you want with me? I mean, because I'm what? I'm lame in my feet. What did I ever do to you? <laughs> right? <laughs> that kind of thing. So I can see Mephibosheth kind of worried about it. And I'm sure that he was a tad scared going before David. He was a tad afraid of going before David. Because he knew the history between David and Saul. He was afraid. What is David has found me out. I am the last remaining heir in the house of Saul. What could David possibly want with me? Hmm. Do we go to the Lord in fear? Not in the good kind of fear, but in the, oh my gosh, am I going to be toast here kind of fear? And sometimes that's good. (laughs) So David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and said to his, uh, and said that what is your servant that I should look, that you should look upon such a dead dog as I, even when the Lord says, I mean, he told him, don't be afraid. I'm about to do something good in your life. And that's what God does to us sometimes. He says, I'm about to do something good in your life. And we argue with him endlessly on why he shouldn't. Like, he's going to go, oh, you're right. I made a mistake. Sorry about that. (laughs) You know, but that's what we do. He's, I want to pour out goodness on your life. And we go, but I don't deserve it. You're right. My nature, love, I love you. I pour out my grace on you because you don't deserve it. Because I love you. You're right, you didn't do anything for it. He understands that. He understands that. It wouldn't be grace if we could earn it. It wouldn't be. So, so what am I that you should look up, on, uh, look up on such a dead dog as I? And the king said to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said, uh, and he called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. I think it's pretty cool that David, and we're going to talk about why in just a moment, and I'm sure most of you know why, he had been putting aside the wealth of Saul to give to somebody in his house. He had been putting aside that wealth to give to someone in Saul's house for a reason. And we'll talk about the reason and how it pertains to us. You therefore and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then Ziba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king has commanded, his servant, so will your servant do. As for Mesibapheth, said the king, again, a second time, he reiterates this. He shall eat at my table, and then what? Be like one of the king's sons. He's going to be at my table, not as a guest, as a son, as an heir, jointly, having the same privileges and rights of royalty as if he were born into the family. I find that it's interesting that even though he's returning all the wealth to Mephibosheth, from Saul's house, he commands the servants to work it for him, so he's going to have an abundance, but he says, you know what, I love you so much, I don't want you to touch that, I want you to share in my abundance. 
Think about that. He says, I don't want you to use your abundance. I'm going to have people work the land for you. So there will always be abundance in your house, but you will sit at my table and you will enjoy my abundance. Amen. That's good. The king is requesting you to come sit at his table. And I'm going to make sure that you have an abundance anyway, but I love you so much and I'm going to pour my grace on you to such an extent. I don't even want you to touch that. Enjoy mine. Eat at my table continually. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah and all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Meshivapheth. So Meshivapheth dwelt, he lived in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table. I think it's interesting. And he was lame in both his feet. <laughs> What's the picture for us? i move my sword here a little bit. No, I'm good. So what's the picture for us? David had a covenant with Jonathan. Mesibaphet's father, David, had covenant with him. In 1 Samuel 18.1, uh, it said that their souls were knit together. David loved Jonathan. Jonathan loved David. David and Jonathan pledged themselves to one another. The love that David had for Jonathan, and here's what's cool, went on even after Jonathan was gone. The love that he had for Jonathan burned in his heart even after Jonathan was gone. And he said, I loved him so much. I want to share and honor this covenant with whoever else is left in his house because of my love for him. God cut a covenant with Abraham. He said, through you, all the families of the world will be blessed. In the garden, he created Adam. And what did he say when he created Adam? He said, let us make man in our image. He wanted somebody like him. He wanted somebody that he could share with. It burned. They, or, uh, Adam and the Lord walked and talked with each other in the cool of the day. He loved the relationship. It burned in his heart. And in that betrayal in the garden, it still burned in his heart. And he cut a covenant with Abraham. And he said, I will restore this. And he sent us Christ. He sent us Christ. And in Galatians 3, we see the honoring of that covenant. And he says, if ye be Christ, in Christ, you are what? Abraham's seed. The love that I had for Abraham. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. Abraham was a pretty cool guy in God's book. He was. He said, if you be in Christ, you are what? Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I am going to bless your seed, Abraham. Why? Because I love you. I love you. I'm going to make a nation mighty out of you. I'm going to raise up my standard in you. It will be your seed. You are the footprint for the rest of the world. And he said, 
and I don't want anything to mess that up, and I love you so much, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send Christ. I'm going to send Christ, and he is going to make it all perfect. He's going to make it all right. And then you will be my son. Where's the heir seated? At the table next to the dad, the king. That's where the heir is seated. The heir is not, you know, in the cheap seats, nosebleed section, watching down on teleprompter, right? The heir sits. Mind scramble? Where's Christ seated? Right hand of the Father. Where are we seated? In Christ. Where's Christ seated? At the right hand of the Father. Where are you seated? In Christ. Where? At the right hand of the Father. Woo! Get that one. Get that one. So, what did Meshibbeth, when we look at him, what did Mephibosheth do to earn this life bounty? Nothing. Nothing. As a matter of fact, he was running and hiding. <laughs> he was running and hiding. He didn't, why is David calling me? Oh, he found me. Dang. That's where we spend a lot of our life. We spend a lot of our times running and hiding. But here is the truth. Even though Mephibosheth was running and hiding, he was lame in his feet, he was still royalty and heir according to the covenant that David and Jonathan had. He didn't know it. If ye be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You can run and hide and be lame in your feet. You are still royalty. Amen. The Father is calling you to the table. God is calling you to the table. As with David, you know, David in this, if, if you look in this story, David is sort of a redeemer. He's returning Mephibosheth to his place of honor because of that covenant. So he's redeemed us. God did the same thing with us in Christ. He said, I, I, I tried it once with Adam, but I'm going to make it absolutely perfect and infallible here. In Christ, it's complete. And you can come to me, and you will be my son, you will be my daughter, and I will be your father. He's redeemed. Everything that we thought we'd lost in Christ, we have completely. Amen. Will you come? Not for a meal. God's graciousness, his love towards you. He said, I have the table set for you always. I know sometimes I go, yeah, I, I, thanks for the bologna sandwich, Dad, I'm out. <laughs> Is that his heart to me? No, he says, I want you to eat here always. I think it's really cool when we get the picture that David said, Ziba, I want you to work the land from Mephibosheth. I'm gonna, he, I mean, you are now his servant. You are now his servant. But him, him, he's going to be with me. His house will always have, but he's going to be with me. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Be in my presence continually. And in addition to the fact that you are always covered, you always have, there is no lack, you're not without anything. In addition to that, because you're continually with me, all this other stuff will be added to you. 
I don't want you to use your stuff. I mean, if we get that picture in our hearts, then we no longer believe we're not worthy. Mephibosheth was lame. I'm lame. We're all lame sometimes. But our father looks at us and he says, doesn't matter. Sit. Sit. Be with me all the time. But I'm lame. I know. I know. That's not news to me. But I love you in spite of. Be with me. Will you sit at the Father's table continually? You are royalty. You are worthy. His grace in Christ has made it so. Father, we thank you for your love that you pour out on us. We thank you. We don't know the, 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 the limits. We can't put into words just how awesome you are. Father, and thank you that you don't run short with me. I'm lame so much. And I'm scared when I come to the throne because I know that I've screwed it up and I want to work it out, but there's nothing I can do. And you say, but you don't have to do anything. Just come. My grace is sufficient for you. We thank you, Father, that you've set a place at your table for us as sons and daughters always. We praise you in this day. We thank you that you walk with us. May every person here be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. That was the beginning. And he has this pulpit till he is complete because there's a burning word in that young man. And he's my spiritual son. I love him with all my heart. And make sure you get somebody here Tom, are you ready to do this for however many weeks you want to? Uh, if we can start in about a week or so. Yes, I will take care of next Sunday, and then we'll st stick you back in. Is that good? Okay. So I'll preach next Sunday, and Tom will have the rest of the time until he has his message complete. I honor my son. And I thank you for being here this morning. So make sure we get some folks out to hear what Tom has to say, because that was beautiful. I love that. That was gorgeous. Well done. So, Father, I, I, I stand in your shadow as your child. And I look at your greatness and the vastness of your strength. And I love how you pour out your grace. And we honor you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.